Welcome to Nancy Gaskins Talks Business. My name is Nancy Gaskins, and I am your host. Folks, you can listen live by computer or by telephone by calling in at 347-857-1169. That's 347-857-1169. All my shows are recorded and archived so you can listen and learn online all year long, 24-7. On today's episode, you will meet Robin Brimmer, also known as Ribbons the Clown. Robin is an ordained minister who appeared on the Tom Letty TV show, In God, Your Will Succeed, and several radio shows. She is also a comic ventriloquist, motivational speaker, sharing keys to working the kingdom system. Robin is the author of several Christian-based books and study courses. Today, we'll be discussing Upside Down Love, The Unfair Truth About Grace. You'll want to listen in today because Robin's going to offer a free download for everyone listening in. Welcome to the show, Robin. Hi. I'm so excited to be here today. So, Robin, can you tell us a little bit about your background, share some interesting things about yourself to let us know who exactly Robin Brimmer is? Well, you know, I grew up like a lot of people, most people. You grow up, you go to church, um, I was raised in church, you know, the kind of thing where your parents take you on a Sunday and drop you off, <laughs> and uh, you just kind of go because it's the right thing to do, and uh, it's powerless, it's religion. And that's kind of my background, how I grew up. And I didn't really know about Jesus, but I would lay out in my backyard on the hill, and I'd look at the stars, and I'd say, wow, there's got to be a God out there, and he's got to be good. And so at 13 years old, I gave my life to God, but I didn't know anything about Jesus. And about, I guess, 20 years later, uh, somebody invited me to go to church on Easter, and I actually heard the gospel message from the beginning to the end, and I understood it. And because of that, excuse me, I gave my heart to Jesus. But, you know, it seemed like there was no change or no power in the churches. It was like everybody who I knew who went to church were just as sick, just as divorced, just as powerless, just as unhappy and fearful as everybody else. And that kind of began my whole search. And um, how my books began was through this hunger and this search for knowing God rather than knowing about a God. So I know there's not very many, I don't know the number of ordained ministers that are female. Can you tell us about that journey? (laughs) Well, actually, um, the first thing I decided to do is because I was ministering as Ribbons the Clown uh, in different denominations, I I felt as though I needed some kind of credibility from the different uh, denominations. So I saw it being licensed, which was um, you're under probation for a year. You have to go through courses, and you're sort of mentored. And then after that process, which legally gave me the right to marry and marry people, after that process, I decided, well, I'm going to take it one step further. I'm going to be ordained. And so I went through Joan Hunter's ministry, which is a signs and wonders ministry, and that's what I was hungry for. And I had to go through courses and classes and hours and hours of study and and learning hands-on experience, like how to lay hands on the sick and see them healed, that kind of thing. And, And that was my... Uh, how I was ordained, and that was probably about six, seven years ago, and I never regret doing that, because no matter what denomination you're in, having that ordination gives you the credibility that they know that you're not just a a, a fly-by-night person, that that you've done your studying, that you know your stuff. Take a look at this book. I've got it right here in front of me. It's Upside Down Love. The Unfair Truth About Grace. Can you tell us what about this book, What, who are your readers, uh, what is your focus, and what is it that you want people to learn when reading this book? Well, it was, all my books have been my journey of discovery, because I can only teach where I've come from. And I've, the people I want to reach was the people I was, the kind of person I was. I was second religion without no power. My whole life consisted of trying to be good enough, trying to follow rules, and it wasn't about a relationship with God. And and so in this process, this was a two, three-year process that I couldn't believe I would go to church and I would hear the pastor say, oh, get up here and repent or you're going to hell. 
and I was saved for five years or six years. And and just because I did some stupid mistake last night, I was going to hell. And I would fight this in my spirit. I would say, how can this be, God? How can this be a loving God that one day I'm doing good and the next day I make a mistake? So all of that was erased. And, and one day I'm saved and unsaved and saved and unsaved. And, and that was my journey and that was my struggle. And I was I felt as though my whole life was um, trying to be good enough, trying to do good enough, following rules, and had nothing to do with God. And so... Through that journey, I came to realize um, through praying for people in churches and ministering in churches and on the Internet, I came to realize that this is a problem, that Christians today are not walking in power and peace because they, they, their relationship with God is, is up and down all the time. They don't know that they are valuable and they are loved and that it's all through the work of Jesus, not their own work. And this is the group of people that I'm trying to reach. I'm I'm trying to reach the saved and the unsaved, but I'm trying to reach people, the everyday Christian who thinks it's about following the rules and showing them it's about relationship. And it is an awesome, power-filled, peaceful, joyful um, journey. Well, it looks like you've got some really uh, great information here. Let's start off with this first one. Grace. A lot of people may not even understand what grace means, what the word means. So tell us what grace, what does it mean, and how did the sacrifice of Jesus give me salvation forever? In other words, I can't lose my salvation, correct? Right, right. And this is a very controversial, controversial, that's a big word for me. (laughs) Um, This is a a subject (laughs) that people will fight over. But, and I did for two, three years, so I knew that I knew. And it's very simple. And grace is God giving you something you don't deserve, something you haven't earned. And that's why the book is called Upside Down Love and unfair because people will say, well, you mean this guy who did this and he dies, he's going to, to heaven, but I was good all my life and, and I'm going to heaven too? You know, it's unfair. Grace is unfair because it shows God's love and it's about his love. Grace means something that you didn't earn, that that you you didn't earn it. God doesn't have to give it to you. He's giving it to you because He's good, not because you're good. And and if you look at the scriptures, like in Hebrew 10.10, 10, it says Jesus became an offering for our sin so that we'd be saved and cleared. And this is, I believe, the New Living Bible. I'm not sure. So that we would be saved and cleared of all guilt of our sin, a one-time sacrifice for all our lifetime of sin. And if you think about it, Jesus died 2,000 years ago. You weren't even born. You didn't even do one sin yet. So when Jesus died, uh, all sin is required to have a sacrifice. Jesus became our sacrifice for us, and he died before we were even born. So when we ask Jesus to come into our life and accept that free gift that we didn't pay for, then we are saved because of his work, because of his sacrifice, and we stay saved. We then become sealed in the Holy Spirit in one spirit with Jesus. It's not saved today, do something stupid, unsaved, saved today. It's about God's goodness and his love. Several people are confused about uh, this next question. What what part of us gets saved when we ask God to come into our lives? Well, you know, that is an, I love that question. That question is so awesome. And that question will set a lot of people free. First of all, the, in Hebrews 12:9, it says, God is called the Father of Spirits. We are first the Spirit, and then we live in a body, and we have a soul. Our soul, soul is our mind, will, and emotions. And when we're born again, the Scripture says that we become one spirit with Jesus. We become one with him, and we are sealed in the Holy Spirit. So you are really a spirit living inside of a body. That's why we're going to live forever when we die. We're going to live forever in hell if we don't have that free gift that Jesus paid this price for our sins. Or we're going to live forever in heaven with Jesus in his presence and in in relationship and fellowship with him. And because we are a spirit, and also in, I'm not sure where it is, but it says that may the Lord God um, something, uh, 
completely your body, spirit, and soul. It shows there's three definitions, three different parts, and we're created in the image of God, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus the Word. So we are a, we are a spirit. Our real, our real you is our spirit, and that's what got saved, and that's what's perfect and sealed in the Holy Spirit. And then we live in a body, and we have a soul, which our mind is our mind, will, and emotions. The Bible's broken up into uh, two, and I know I hear a lot of people, uh, you know, talk about, oh, I'm 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 a New Covenant uh, Christian. You know, I go by the, the New Testament. So, what is it that you can share with us? What does the New Covenant mean for a Christian? Well, first of all, the new always replaces the old. If there wasn't a reason to have a new, you would stick with the old. So, we're not. The old covenant is a shadow of what's to come. And the old covenant, the new covenant, is the reality that we're in. And you know, the, uh, the new covenant doesn't actually start to the book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is still part of the old covenant. Jesus is fulfilling the, uh, the law, the Jewish law, in, in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the new covenant is about following the Holy Spirit, not the law. Uh, one of the scriptures says, as for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, my spirit who is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth. So the new covenant is um, taking the place of the old covenant. In the old covenant, the law had to be followed, and it was really only for the Jews. The law and all that was for the Jews. The new covenant is for anybody who receives Jesus. And it's about following the Holy Spirit, not the law. That's why the Holy Spirit is so important. For example, the Old Covenant says, uh, do not commit adultery. But the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit will lead you on how to love on your wife, what steps to do, how to do it, maybe to massage her feet at night or to make a cake or to help her with the kids. And it will lead you in how not to commit adultery instead of saying, don't commit adultery. The Holy Spirit is so much better because he'll show you how to be the person God created you to be. And then it becomes about a relationship with the Holy Spirit um, because of the blood of Jesus with the Father God. Instead of following a law as servants, we are now children of God. And, and because of what Jesus did, the devil can no longer point his finger at us and, and have a right blame us and condemn us and saying we broke the law, and therefore we don't have fellowship with God because we're feeling guilty and ashamed. But the new covenant allows us to follow the Holy Spirit and have fellowship, and the focus is on fellowship instead of behavior. Right behavior follows. So what are five things that you can tell our listeners today that Jesus' death did for us when he died on that cross? Well, these five things are so important and life-changing. For number one, he made us holy, unblameable, and unre- unreprovable. And through his death, we're now unblameable. I mean, we're perfect. We're holy in his sight, and that's Colossians one twenty-two. And we can't. The devil can no longer use that tool against us and say, "Hey, you broke the law. You, you, you know, you're not behaving right. You can't have a relationship with Jesus." But because we are holy, our spirit is holy, blameless, and above reproach in, his, in Jesus' sight, the devil's tool has been taken away from us. And this empowers us to behave correctly and to know that we're staying safe because we are um, perfect in God's sight. And then uh, the death of Jesus cleanses us from a guilty conscience, and that's Hebrews 9.14, the blood of Jesus uh makes us have a guilty conscience. And that's so important because when you have a guilty conscience, like you owe rent, you're going to run away from the landlord. You're not going to want to come near the landlord because you think you owe rent and you're going to be, think he's going to remind you of it. And the same thing with our daddy God. Um, When we have a guilty conscience, we tend to run away from him. Now, the other thing that uh, his death did for us, it gave us his divine nature, which is 1 Peter 1, 4. It says, uh, through this, we're partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. We're created in the image of our daddy, and through the death of Jesus, we now have his divine nature. We're also empowered, Ephesians 2, 5, we're empowered and made alive, we're raised up, and we are seated in heavenly places. That shows our royalty, our dominion, and our authority over all of the earth. And then 
he took away the power of death and fear, Hebrews 2.14, that through death he might destroy him who has had, had, had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were in their lifetime subject to bondage. The devil can't come in and just kill you in the middle of the night. You have to give him that authority by agreeing with him. He can just suggest it to you. But when you start believing him over the word, then you begin to open the doors. And those are the so five things he makes you. Go ahead. Okay. I'm going I'm to do a quick recap for those who might be out here taking notes. Uh, number one, make you holy and unblameable. Colossians 1, 22. <laughs> Cleanse you from a guilty conscience. That would be Hebrews 9, 14. Number three, he gave us his divine nature. That would be 2 Peter 1, 4. Empowers you, Ephesians 2, 5. And number five, took away power of death and fear, which is people. Okay, what other things cause us not to sin if we're under the under the law? Or what, what makes people want to act godly? I know a lot of people out here, you know, they get feeling guilty. They know they did something wrong. And... Mm-hmm. Um, what is it that, um, for Christians, that makes us want to act godly? Well, first of all, when we realize we're not under the law, we can't keep the law. we got to stop striving to keep the law. We just need to follow the Holy Spirit. And this is a, an area where people want to fight. Okay, well, if we're under grace, we're no matter what we do, we're saved. What's going to keep us from not sinning? You're giving everyone a license to go out and commit sins. Well, right here. Uh, First Colossians, uh, First Corinthians, fifteen thirty four says, "Awake to righteousness and sin not." When you know you are right with God, that's called righteousness. When you awake to righteousness, you won't sin. Next one is godly. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. People think, "Oh, God's condemning America because we're all sinful." Um, No. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. In other words, goodness of God leads us to act right. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. That's John 14, 26 and 16, 12. He'll guide us in all truth. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our righteousness, not our sin. That's John, 4, uh, John 16, 9 and 10. The anointing teaches us. 1 John 2, 27. The law is written in our hearts. Now, God, through the Holy Spirit, shows us what's right right and wrong and that's jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-three, and in john eight ten, it says go and sin no more when we know we are forgiven it empowers us with such great love to not want to sin it's like when you're married you love your spouse so much you're not going to go cheat on them because you are in love and that's basically what's happening here and then the second last one is the grace of god teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust that's first uh, that's uh, Titus 2.12, and then we are created in God's image, Genesis 1.27. Our new nature doesn't want to sin. It's our old nature when we try to follow the law and get into the, the things of the flesh that we um, we sin. But when we know we are saved, we're saved, we're adopted, we're, we're not going to lose it, we fall so in love with God that we chose and we have the power we choose not to sin. Why is it so important for people uh, to not feel condemned instead of going around with a guilty conscience all the time? Well, in Romans 5, it says uh, uh, judgment came from Adam's sin, and it resulted in condemnation to everyone born after him. But God sent his his son into the world not to condemn us, but to pay the price for our sins so we wouldn't be condemned. When we are feeling condemned and guilty and full of shame, um, and feeling judged, then we're not, we're, it takes us, uh, not God, it doesn't take God away from us, but it takes our mind, our thinking away from God, thinking, I missed the mark, I made a mistake, um, you know, God doesn't love me, he, you know, because we're always taught, you sin, you break down the wall, God doesn't hear you, God doesn't hear sinners, you sin, God won't hear you, uh, even if they're not taught that you lose your your salvation, people are taught that when you sin, God turns his ear away from you, and that's not true. It's not like plucking daisies off of a, off of a um, petals off of a daisy saying he loves me, he loves me not. It's a secure thing, and, and when we know that, that we're secure and we're not condemned, we're not guilty, we're not shameful, we begin to walk in power, and that's the whole key is to walk in that power. 
that we see ourselves the same way Jesus sees us, perfect through the blood of Jesus. And we have confidence in our heart toward God answering our prayer. Why do I need to know that I have righteousness? Well, well, our authority to rule comes from righteousness and the grace that God gave us. Uh, the scripture says that um, those who have the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through Christ Jesus. That's Romans 5.21. And when you know you are right with God, that you are righteous with God, you will begin to, instead of spending your lifetime and every moment thinking, oh, did I sin? Am I breaking a rule? What did I forget? Instead of thinking that way, you will begin to walk in power and authority. You will not be sick. You will... Uh, you know, you will lay hands on people and see people healed. Um, grace reigns through righteousness. So it's important that we know we're righteous and that we know we have grace. The kingdom of God is also righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Our life could, should consist of peace and joy and knowing we're right with God. And the Bible also says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not our own. And all the things are added to us. And the kingdom of God comes with all provision. So righteousness is what the body of Christ is missing today, is knowing that they are right with God. Therefore, they can stand up and walk in power instead of fear and say, God, rapture me out of here. They can say, God, you know, even though this is happening in the world today, I know that I'm healed. I know that I have all my finances met and so on. So the name of your book is Upside Down Love. The Unfair Truth About Grace. So you talked about uh, grace wasn't fair. You can have somebody who sins their whole life and then gets to the end of their life and they decide they want to get right with God, get saved, and they're going to heaven right alongside me. Who I've tried all my life since I was 10 years old, but pretty much do, you know, like you said, the right thing. And we all not fair. And I, I like this next question. So how exactly... Do you propose that we bring justice on earth? I know a lot of people, uh, you know, are scared for the United States of America right now because of all the things, thanks to social media, that are, you know, in our, you know, we can pop up on our computer and learn things that probably was always going around, you know, since the beginning of time. But since we have social media, we now learn about it. And so we're appalled at some of the things that's mm-hmm. going on in America. So what is it that you think, how, how can we bring justice on earth? Well, first of all, um, we have to start with ourselves in our community. Justice, we have to understand what justice is. Justice is receiving everything that the blood of Jesus paid for us to have. Justice is taking those demonic forces and taking authority and dominion over them and not allowing them to do what they're doing. Really, all the problems that are happening in the world are Christians, are are problem because we have not been walking in justice uh, we have not been saying hey you people over there who are doing that you can't do that uh, you know you can't touch these people or you can't do this uh, or even things like earthquakes and tsunamis it's the earth groaning uh, it's not judgment but what we should be saying is, hey tornado you are not allowed to kill steal and destroy get up there now i take authority and dominion over you because god gave us all authority and dominion over everything on the earth and he said rule and subdue in other words he said your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven if something is not allowed in heaven if the blood of jesus paid for you not to have to have this and you can see what those things are in psalms 103 and isaiah 54 um, those are two big sections that show you what Jesus did. We should all be healthy, uh, prosperous, um, peaceful, and so on. And you find out what those things are that he pays for us to have, then you take dominion and authority over it. Like somebody is sick, you're sick. Hey, sickness, you're not allowed in my body. By the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. I take authority over you. I command you to go in Jesus' name. And you start there. You begin to start in your own body, in your own life. Then you then you go out and you lay hands on your neighbors, you speak to the weather, you speak to political situations, and you do this in your own closet or, you know, you don't have to go out and make people think you're weird. But the Holy Spirit has given us a job and power to change the earth like it will be in heaven to bring his will. And whenever there's a problem like what's going on right now, we Christians need to stand up and declare justice for those people 
and for those situations. But if we don't know what justice is, if we don't know what the whole, what Jesus did and the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we will look and act and be as weak as the world instead of being the solution to today's problems. Robin, I thank you for joining us today. I've got your links listed on the episode, but for those that are listening, which you can learn more about you and buy your books online, give us your website address. Um, it's Robin Bremer, R-O-B-I-N-B-R-E-M-E-R dot net. And uh, you can get some stuff there. And also um, on this site here, uh, on Amazon, you can also download the a free Kindle App, app if you don't have one, or a free, and also the free book as a Kindle um, book today. Tonight's guest was Robin Bremer. She's the author of several books, but today we were talking about Upside Down Love, The Unfair Truth About Rights. I invite you to uh, check out Nancy Gaston's Talk to Business because I have interviewed Robin before and she's got a lot of interesting topics and uh, I know you'll, you'll love to hear about her. Thank you again for joining us today. I look forward to next time. You've been listening to Nancy Gaston Talk Business Forming America, one entrepreneur at a time. Mm-hmm.